good evening and a special welcome to anyone who is here at Gresham College for the first time. In my lecture tonight and the one next month, I shall be exploring the mathematics used in various computer algorithms. Tonight I shall introduce some, I think, particularly fascinating mathematics, which has valuable applications um, in, for example, allowing us to, us to pair off people for dating purposes or to assign workers to employment vacancies. But naturally, mathematics is enormously helpful in matters of love. Here, for example, is a beautiful equation which describes a heart. x squared plus y squared minus 1, all cubed, minus x squared y cubed equals 0. A beautiful shape, so you can't have love without mathematics. <laughs> but given the popular image of mathematicians, you might wonder whether we are the right people to talk about dating. A common public perception of mathematicians is reflected in a magazine interview given some time ago in which the actress Molly Ringwald said, my love life's not really going anywhere these days. Of course, he won't find me dating any mathematicians. And apparently, sorry, um, Okay. And apparently, though I haven't been able to check this because I don't have the book myself, Graham Masterton's How to Drive Your Man Wild in Bed gives guidance on how to choose a lover. He lists professions to avoid, and mathematician is top of that list. <laughs> but, but if you think mathematicians are an incapable of romance, I invite you to think again. You're probably familiar with the Mobius strip, a simple band with a twist in it, like my wristband, which I remembered to put on specially this morning. Um, and the Mobius strip has only one side and only one edge. You can make one by cutting a strip of paper, giving it a twist, and taping the ends together. It has interesting properties. Try cutting it in half, lengthwise, and see what you get, or cutting it at a third of its width. So for this exercise, my assistant is going to make two Mobius strips. The first one is blue, and she's just given the paper a twist and will join the edges together. So that is the first Mobius strip. See it there? And she's now going to make a second one. This one is pink, as it happens. And the important thing here, when you do it yourself, the twists have to be in the opposite direction. So these two Mobius strips are not identical. They're going to be mirror images of each other. So we now have two Mobius strips with the twists in the opposite direction. And my assistant is now going to join them together by basically facing them against each other at right angles and securing them with some more tape. So all we've done is just drawing the two strips together at right angles to each other. Now she's going to cut them in half. So she's starting off by cutting the blue strip lengthwise. And if you haven't seen this before, and you can mark out what's going to result, then I'll be very impressed because I certainly couldn't. But we're cutting round the, all the way around the blue strip. And that now springs apart. And now she's going to do the same with the pink strip. Can you see what we're getting yet? And if you sort it out, we have. And what we have is two linked hearts. So, having dispelled the myth that mathematics and romance don't go together, let's move on to the maths of internet dating. That's a big business. The first thing we can learn from mathematics is that internet dating um, can considerably enhance our chances of finding a suitable mate. 
Most of us don't meet many people outside our limited social circles. And so expanding our pool of potential partners through the internet means that there's much more likelihood that there are some incompatible we might meet if we can find them. And this does work. My boss met his wife in this way. But for it to work, dating agencies need to be able to match people who are compatible. This is a problem which requires both mathematical methods and psychological insight. Professor Glenn Wilson, whose Gresham College lectures many of you will be familiar with, has written about this topic. You don't have to take my word for it that mathematics is involved. Um, last year, the fictional Professor Tony, the hero of Charlotte Corey's radio drama, Find the Perfect Partner for You.com, um, gave a paper at a conference on new directions in applied mathematical modeling, and his paper was on the mathematics of internet dating. Just how complex the problem is can be seen from a case history which attracted some publicity last month. Chris McKinley is a mathematician who is hoping to find love through an online dating site. In this site, members answered about 350 questions from a bank of several thousand, and the site's algorithm used these answers to generate promising matches. But McKinley was not having any success, so, being a mathematician, he worked out what was going wrong. He concluded that the questions which he had chosen to answer were not those that were being answered by the kind of woman he wanted to meet. It wasn't enough to provide the right answers to the questions. He also had to choose which questions were most likely to match those chosen by his most compatible prospective partners. Fortunately, his mathematical training and computing skills enabled him to undertake a comprehensive data mining exercise. He divided the profiles of 20,000 women into seven clusters, worked out which clusters were most likely to contain women of interest to him, and performed an optimization exercise to choose which questions to answer in order to attract women in his preferred clusters. And this worked um, because one of the women he met through a strategy is now his fiance. Okay, so how else can mathematicians help suitors? Well, one useful piece of mathematical guidance comes from what was once called the marriage problem, but is now much more boringly called the secretary problem. Suppose that during the course of my life, I expect to meet a succession of N possible wives. As soon as I choose one, I'm out of the market. Each one must be accepted or rejected before I meet the next, and I cannot go back to someone I have previously rejected. My only basis for choice is comparison with previous candidates. I have no absolute numerical scale on which I can rate partners, but I can say whether the current candidate is better or worse than previous ones. How do I give myself the best possible chance of finding the best partner under these conditions? Well, there is a mathematical answer to this, and that is that I reject the first n over e possibles, where e is Euler's number 2.71828 or so, the base of the natural logarithms. And then, having rejected these first n over e, I then accept the next woman I meet who is better than any of those I have already rejected. If I follow this strategy, the chance that I will be matched with the best potential partner is 1 over e, which is about 0.368, or just over 1 in 3. So this suggests that if I expect to meet about 11 potential partners, I should reject the first four, and then accept the next one who is better than any of these. If I expect to have 100 to choose from, then I will reject the first 37. This is an impressive piece of mathematics, and it gives a surprisingly high probability, I feel, of finding the best partner. But how useful is it in practice? The assumption is that the selection of a partner is a one-person decision. I choose my preferred partner, but I don't consider the possibility that she might reject me. <laughs> so the conditions necessary for the mathematics to work may not actually apply in a real-life situation. And there's another question which comes to mind. Do I want to maximise my chance of finding the best possible partner, which is still less than 
Or would it be more pragmatic to aim for a higher probability of finding a pretty good partner? Perhaps I would prefer a 90% chance of an acceptable partner to a 37% chance of the best. Now, in fact, maths can help me to solve that problem, but the point I want to make is that any applied mathematics rests on assumptions. The assumptions behind some of the most interesting math maths that appears to apply to our romantic relationships may not be entirely realistic, but these scenarios are still helpful in understanding what is actually some very useful mathematics. So applying the secretary problem to the selection of a spouse may be slightly artificial, but what mathematics do dating agencies use? They are generally trying to generate a reasonable number of possible matches for their clients. I want to step back a bit from that problem and look at more basic mathematics. I'm going to start with some work by the great British mathematician Philip Hall, one of the great algebraists of the last century. Most of Hall's most famous work was on the subject of group theory, an increasingly important branch of pure mathematics. But he also gave his name to Hall's marriage theorem. Here is one formulation of it. Let E be a non-empty finite set, and let F, which is S1, S2 up to Sm, be a family of non-empty subsets of E. Then we can find a set of M elements of E, one chosen from each Si, if and only if the union of any K of the subsets Si contains at least K elements for every K between 1 and M. OK, that may not be entirely clear, um, and even if you've worked out what it means, the relevance to marriage may be obscure. But it's more commonly written in more direct language. So here's the traditional formulation. Suppose we have a set of M women and a set of men, some of whom are known to some of the women. Then we can marry each woman to a man that she knows, if and only if every set of K women collectively know at least K men for every K between 1 and M. So what is this actually saying? Well, let's suppose we have four men and four women, and woman W1 knows the men M1 and M2, W2 knows M1 and M3, W3 knows M3 and M4, and W4 knows M2 and M4. It's actually useful to represent this diagrammatically, so here I've listed the men and women and joined them up if they know each other. Now, in this case, each woman knows at least one man. Every pair of women knows at least two men between them. You can check that out quite easily. Um, any set of three women knows at least three men between them. That's a little bit harder to see, but you can check the possible sets. And the set of all four women know all four men. And that's the condition that the theorem requires. Any set of K women knows at least K men between them. So this theorem tells us we can pair these couples off. And in fact, we can do so, for example, by matching W1 with M1, W2 with M3, W3 with M4, and W4 with M2. And there are other equally valid ways to pair them, but the theorem tells us we can certainly do it. But now suppose we have slightly different connections. So now W1 knows M1 and M2, W2 knows M1 and M2, W3 knows M1 and M2, and W4 knows all the men. So again, we can draw the diagram. Now in this case, we actually have more connections than in the previous case. There are more lines in the diagram, there are more pairs who know each other. So you might think it would be easier to find a matching. But if we look at the three women, W1, W2, and W3, we see that between them, they only know two men, M1 and M2. So we can't find three husbands from these two men. So in this case, no matching is possible. And that's because Hall's condition is not satisfied. We have three women who know only two men between them, and this makes it impossible for us to marry them all off. So in fact, it's fairly clear that Hall's condition, if Hall's condition is not satisfied, then we cannot pair off the women and the men. So at each marriage, someone they know. What Hall proved is that the converse is also true. That is, if the condition is satisfied, then we can find a pairing. 
And that's a very nice and possibly slightly surprising result. So at this point, from the point of view of a mathematician, the marriage problem is solved. We have a necessary and sufficient condition to tell us exactly whether or not a solution is possible for any set of men and women. There's no further interest in this marriage problem for a pure mathematician. Tedious details, like how to find a suitable pairing, can be left to others. But some others do, are interested in how to find the pairings, so computer scientists are not satisfied to be told that the solution exists, but they want to know how actually to find that solution. And for them, there's still work to be done. But again, there are also human issues. The formulation of this problem uses only one criterion. A woman can marry a man so long as she knows that man. This is actually quite a weak criterion for marrying someone. <laughs> there are people I know who I would not want to marry, but the theorem doesn't allow for that. Neither does it allow for preferences. I might be prepared to marry A, B or C, but I possibly have preferences between them. So we're now going to explore algorithms which match people taking into account their preferences between potential partners. For this discussion, I shall assume that we have M women and M men, and that each man has ranked the woman in order of his preference, while each woman has similarly ranked the men, and there are no ties in the ranking. So for any two potential partners, you have a preference for one over the other, and this preference is consistent, so that if you prefer A to B and B to C, then you prefer A to C. As an aside, is this consistency of preferences which makes possible old jokes like, which is better, eternal happiness or a ham sandwich? Well, the answer is obviously the sandwich. Um, bit pie, because nothing is better than eternal happiness, and a ham sandwich is better than nothing. OK, better get quickly move back to the real subject. So suppose we have four pairs here, four men and four women, with preferences as follows. Don't worry too much about the detail. Um, it'll, we'll see how the algorithm works. You know? But A prefers X to Y to Z to W, B prefers Y to Z to W to X, and so on. And the men also have preferences. So W prefers D to C to B to A, and so on. There are many ways we can pair people off. We could simply match them in alphabetical order, A with W, B with X, C with Y, and D with Z. In this case, that means that everyone is matched with a person who is the bottom of their list. So this isn't a very good matching. If we're simply pairing people off for some not very important purpose, like tennis partners for an afternoon, or passengers to drivers for the journey between a wedding and a reception, this may not matter too much. But if you're marrying people off, this particular matching is not really likely to be very well received. So what else could we do? People would like to be paired with the first choice. So this is the same list again. So if you pair them with the first choice, we have A with X, B with Y, C with Z, and D with W. And you can see it in fact, every man and every woman now has their first choice partner. So that's the ideal matching. If we can do that, the problem is solved. But it may not be possible to do that. A may be the most beautiful and charming woman, and W may be the handsomest man, or the richest, and all the men might make A their first choice, and all the women might rate W above all the others. And in this case, only one person can get their first choice partner. So assigning people to their most preferred partner isn't, in general, going to be possible. So what can we do? Well, we can step back and think about what isn't going to work. Here's a situation we want to avoid. Suppose we have a possible pairing in which we assign A to be married to W and B to be married to X. These are not necessarily the same people as in the previous slide. In this case, A prefers X to her assigned husband W, while X prefers A to his assigned wife B. In this case, A and X are unlikely to go along with this matching. We say that A and X are a rogue couple, and we can see that any matching which includes a rogue couple is going to be unstable, in the obvious sense that things aren't going to last. 
So we'll say that we have a stable matching if there are no rogue couples, that is, no pair who prefer each other to their assigned partners. If you have a stable matching, then none of the people involved can be tempted to swap their current partner for someone they prefer, because nobody in that position would be prepared to have them. So it makes sense that while we cannot ensure that everyone has their most preferred partner, at least we aim for a stable matching. And it turns out that we can always find a stable matching, whatever people's preferences are. So it is quite sensible we make this our objective. So here's our method. It's called the gale shapley algorithm, and it was devised by David Gale and Lloyd Shapley in 1962. Shapley was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2012 for his work in this area. <coughs> so the algorithm begins by hypothetically sitting each woman at a desk. There are then a number of rounds during which all the currently unpaired men, which initially is everybody, go to the desk of their highest ranked woman who has not yet rejected them. And initially, nobody's been rejected. If at any stage, every woman has exactly one man at her desk, then we finished. That gives a matching. And the pairing we have turns out to be a stable matching, as we'll see in a moment. If, however, one or more women has more than one man at her desk, she rejects all her suitors except for the one she ranks highest, who she accepts for the time being. We then proceed to the next round, and we carry on doing this algorithm until it finishes. So let's see how it works in practice. So we'll suppose we have four men and four women with preferences which um, you can follow as the algorithm goes through. So we begin by sitting each woman at a desk. The preferences are at the top of the screen. Um, and inviting the men to go to their desk of a first choice woman. That means that man M1 goes to W1, as does M2. M3 goes to W3. And M4 goes to W4. So W1 has two men at her desk. And she has to choose between them. And her preference is for M1 over M2. So she accepts M1 and rejects M2. So M2 is rejected, while all the other men are temporarily paired. So in the second round, M2 is the only unpaired man. He's been rejected by his first choice, W1. So he tries his second choice, W3. The other men stay where they were. And now W3 has two men to choose from, and she has to choose between M3 and M2, and her preference is for M2, so M3 is now rejected. In round three, M3 is the only unpaired man, so he goes to the desk of his second choice, which is W2. And at this point, we now have one man at each desk, so we found what I am claiming is a stable matching, which pairs W1 with M1, W2 with M3, W3 with M2, and W4 with M4. <coughs> so before we discuss this result, let's see what we can deduce about the workings of this algorithm. First of all, it's guaranteed to terminate. So there's no danger that we can go on forever without reaching a conclusion. How do we know that? Well, if there are n women and n men, then initially there are n squared possible pairings. In any round, either no man gets rejected, in which case we have found a matching and the algorithm will finish, or at least one man gets rejected. In that case, if one man is rejected, that man's attempted pairing has been eliminated. So we have lost one or more of the original n squared possible pairings. So in any round in which the algorithm doesn't finish, we've reduced the number of potential pairings by at least one. So after n squared rounds, we can be sure that the algorithm is terminated because there are no more possibilities to consider. So the algorithm certainly finishes. 
Secondly, we can see that once a woman has a provisional partner at her desk, she will never be unmatched because she only rejects that partner if someone better comes to her. So once she's been matched with someone, she is guaranteed to finish the process assigned to someone at least as good as that provisional partner. And finally, I've claimed, we see that the outcome is a stable matching. How do we know that? Well, do we have any rogue couples? Can any man be a member of a rogue couple? Consider the way the... Sorry. <coughs> Consider any one of the men. Let's call him men. Because of the way the algorithm works, he has already approached all the women he ranks above the partner he's assigned at the end of the algorithm. And he's been rejected by them all, otherwise he would have finished with one of them. He can only be rejected if that woman had, at that point, an alternative partner she ranked above him. But in that case, by our previous comment, the algorithm has assigned her a partner she rates at least as high as that temporary partner, and therefore she prefers her final partner to M. So there's no woman who can form a rogue couple with M because they all prefer their assigned husband to M. And so M, or any, any other man, cannot be part of a rogue couple. So there can't be any rogue couples, which means that the matching must be stable. So the gale shapley algorithm guarantees to find a stable matching for N women and N men in at most N squared steps. The next question you might want to ask is about the implementation of the algorithm. When we did it, we put the women at the desks and let the men circulate. What happens if we do it the other way around, with the men at desks and the women going to their top choice? Incidentally, our recent study has suggested that in the case of speed dating, which is something a bit different, where couples meet briefly and each indicates at the end of the evening which of their partners they would like to meet again, the question of who sits still and who moves around apparently has a significant effect on the outcomes. Usually, I'm told, the women sit at tables and the men move from one table to the next every few minutes. In this situation, women on average put fewer than 10% of the men they meet on their willing to meet again list. But when the men sit at the tables and the women move around, the women tend to be much less choosy and choose to meet far more of the men again. And the psychology of this is obscure at this moment. <laughs> that doesn't actually apply to the Gale Shapley algorithm where the tables and desks are hypothetical and the preferences of the participants are predefined. So what does happen when we apply the algorithm with the men at the desk? So this is the same situation as before, same preferences, this time the men are at the desks, and in the first round, um, W1 and W2 uh, both go to the desk of M1, W3 goes to M2, and W4 goes to M4. M1 has to choose between W1 and W2, and he chooses W1, so W2 is rejected, She's the only one who's rejected, so in round two, she goes to her second choice, M3, and now every man has a, only one woman at his desk, so we found a matching, and in fact, in this case, it is the same matching as before. So perhaps you might think, this always happens, and it doesn't matter which role is taken by the woman and which by the men. Well, let's try another example. So again, I've got a set of preferences here, which we'll follow through as the algorithm proceeds. So if we carry out the algorithm this time with the woman at the desks, first of all, M1 goes to W2, M2 goes to W3, M3 goes to W4, and M4 goes to W1. Every person is matched, and we found a stable matching in which every man has his first choice of partner. So it looks pretty good for the men. What's it like for the woman? Well, if you look closely at their preferences, you see that every woman has been assigned the man she least wants in this case. <laughs> so the matching is stable, because all the men are happy with their wives, so they're not going to be tempted to stray, but the women haven't done very well. But if we do the same 
problem with the men sitting at the desks, same problem, and the women circulate, then W1 goes to M1, W2 to M2, W3 to M3, and W4 to M4. Again, it's a stable matching. This time, every woman has a first choice. And if you check the preferences, we find that every man has a second choice. So you might think this is a better matching than the previous one. What this, matching sh what this example shows is that although the matching found by the gale shapley algorithm has the desirable property of stability, it doesn't necessarily give what you might think of as the best results for all the people involved. So let's think about what we can hope to achieve. We know that we can't guarantee that everyone gets the first choice of partner. And we know that if a matching isn't stable, then it isn't going to work. So we'll define a stable matching as female optimal if there is no alternative possible stable matching in which any woman gets a partner better than the one she gets in this matching. So every woman gets the best partner she can have in any stable matching in this particular matching. So that's as good as you can do for the woman. If you want a stable matching, then this is the one that is best for all the women. We can define male optimal similarly. A stable matching is male optimal if there's no alternative stable matching in which any man is assigned a partner he prefers to the one he has in this matching. Similarly, we can define female and male pessimal. A female pessimal stable matching is one in which every woman gets the worst partner she can be assigned in any stable matching. So when we had our example in which every man got his first choice partner and every woman got her last choice, that example was male optimal and female pessimal. And it turns out, and in fact it's not very difficult to show, that the matching found by the Gale Shapley algorithm with the woman at the desks and the men proposing is, um, is both male optimal and female pessimal. That is, it gives the best possible results for the men and the worst possible results for the women. While we, if, if we apply it with the men at the desks and the women proposing, then it is female optimal and male pessimal. So which way around we do it is quite significant. This also means that if, as in our first example, both algorithms find the same solution, then there's only one possible stable matching. So we have a slightly unfortunate situation. We can apply our algorithm to give the best possible results for women, but in that case the men get the worst, worst possible outcome. Or we can do it the other way around, with the men getting their optimal outcome and the women their worst. Now, you can find analysis on the web applying this to human dating behaviour. The suggestion is that traditional patterns where the men take the initiative, um, as in the woman at desk and men proposing implementation of the Gale Shapley algorithm, lead to outcomes which are good to men and they're so for women. A suggested lesson is that you're more likely to find the best possible partner for you if you take the initiative in approaching potential mates rather than wait to be asked. As one widely circulated academic PowerPoint presentation on this material says, advice to females, learn to make the first move. Another lesson might be that if you want to find your best possible partner, you have to be prepared to face rejections on the way. In the algorithm, it's always the sex which gets rejected, which ends up doing best. These lessons may or may not be, may or may not be valid, but before rushing to conclusions, I think we need to check on the reality of the situation. So let's look at the basic assumptions behind the algorithm. In this discussion, I'm assuming we are using the male optimal version with the woman sitting at desks for the purposes of discussion. So we're assuming that there's a fixed population of men and women, that every man and every woman can rank the opposite sex into an order of preference. 
these preferences do not change. That while she is provisionally attached to one man, every woman is looking to trade up to a better partner, and that everybody would rather be married to somebody, even the person they consider to be the worst possible partner, than not be married at all. Now, all of these assumptions, it seems to me, are highly questionable, to say the least. We have a constantly changing human population as people grow up and move around. While we might be able to rank a small number of potential partners, we cannot assign a rank, um, a realistic rank, to people we hardly know. <coughs> Our opinions of other people change all the time as we get to know them and find out more about them. So our preferences certainly change. Most people actually try to make a relationship work rather than using the courtship period as an opportunity to trade up. And many people would actually prefer a single life to marriage to somebody unsuitable. So human courtship, at least at this point in our history, is about getting to know someone better and finding out how viable a potential partnership is. It doesn't really resemble the gale the algorithm process at all. This isn't a criticism of the algorithm. The algorithm works very well in appropriate situations. A common one is the matching of trainee doctors to hospitals. Here, the hospitals want the best trainees to meet their specific needs. The trainees will prefer certain hospitals depending on specialism, location, and other factors. A similar situation arises in matching law students to internships and lots of other similar situations. These are common situations and the Gale Shapley algorithm applies precisely to them. Historically, before 1962, and when the algorithm was invented, different approaches were taken. It's claimed that where the method used didn't produce a stable matching, then um, things were very unsatisfactory. Employers would sign up trainees very early in their studies to secure those they thought were the best, and they would make offers which were valid only for a very short length of time, sometimes only a couple of hours, in order to force trainees' hands to make quick decisions. The Gale Shapley algorithm is now used in situations like this, um, and it has led to much better results for this kind of matching and has reduced the use of what one might regard as sharp practice. Of course, there's always the issue of whether one is seeking the best possible placements from the point of view of the trainees or from the point of view of the employers. It's also worth noting that small changes to the problem are not necessarily easy to accommodate. The Gale Shapley algorithm, as we have seen, will match N trainee doctors to N hospital placements in at most N squared steps, which means that in terms of computational complexity, it is an efficient algorithm. The time, taken, the time it takes to implement is a polynomial function of the size of the problem. In this case, it's a second order polynomial, a square, which is pretty good. Suppose, however, that in this problem, some of the trainee doctors are couples and they wish to have placements in the same hospital or at least in ones which are nearby. This appears to add a small extra factor to the allocation problem. With this extra condition, it turns out that the problem is computationally much harder. In fact, it's NP complete, which is a computer science term, which means that actually there is no efficient way to solve this problem at all. So this shows that seemingly very similar problems can present very diff different levels of difficulty for a computer. Here now is another situation in which the Gale Shapley algorithm will be useful. Suppose we have a number of tennis players wishing to take part in a doubles tournament. In this situation, there's a fixed pool of potential partners. It is reasonable to suppose that every player knows all the others and can rank every other one as a possible partner. And everyone wants to compete, so no one will withdraw if they don't like their assigned partner. But any matching has to be stable, otherwise any rogue couple could withdraw from the allocation and choose to partner each other instead. So the Gale-Shapley algorithm is going to be perfect for this circumstance 
these are exactly the conditions we need for the Gale Shapley algorithm to be effective. So let's suppose Gresham College decides to organise a tennis tournament. I think this room would just about fall the court quite nicely. Um, so they sign up all top players, naturally. So we've signed up um, Djokovic, Murray and Federer, and Williams, Azarenka and Lee. Um, unfortunately, the budget doesn't extend any further. So our academic registrar, Valerie Shimplin, and I have to fill in to make up numbers. <laughs> so we have four men and four women to be assigned into partnerships with the mixed doubles. Um, I'm going to assign hypothetical preferences. Again, um, I think these are reasonably logical. Um, basically, none of the professionals have seen me or Valerie play, so understandably, they prefer the partner they know to one of us. So we'll apply the algorithm with the women at the desks and the men proposing. So the first round sees Williams having to choose between Djokovic and Federer, um, Azarenka has Murray and Lee has Mann. Um, Williams chooses Djokovic over Federer because he is her preference. So Federer is rejected. It's not always the worst player who is rejected first. Um, and in round two, Federer goes to a second choice, who is Lee. Lee now has to choose between Mann and Federer, and she prefers Federer. So Mann is rejected, and in round three, he tries his second choice, which is Williams. Williams, however, however prefers her previous partner, Djokovic, so Mann is rejected again, and in round four, he tries Azarenka, but she prefers Molly, and so in round five, Man goes to Shimplin, and now everyone is assigned, and we have a stable matching. Um, we know it's stable from the algorithm. Uh, okay, both Man and Shimplin have been assigned a partner they least wanted, but that actually reflects the reality that no better partner was realistically available to either of them. So the algorithm works well in that case. We now come to the men's doubles. Here, the preferences amongst the four men might be as follows. Djokovic prefers Federer to Murray, to a man, and so on. Um, so can we find a stable matching here? Well, any matching must pair them into two pairs, and man must be partnered with one of the others. So suppose, first of all, man is paired with Murray. Well, Murray would rather be playing with either of the others, and it turns out that Federer prefers Murray to his assigned partner, Djokovic. So Federer and Murray are a rogue couple, and this matching isn't stable. OK, what if man is paired with Federer? In this case, Djokovic is now partnering Murray. Federer would rather be partnered by either Djokovic or Murray, and it seems Djokovic prefers Federer to Murray, so Federer and Djokovic form a rogue couple. Third possibility is a man is partnered with Djokovic, but in this case, Murray and Djokovic would rather be playing with each other than the partners they've been assigned. So whatever we do, it seems we have a rogue couple. There's no stable matching with these four players. So what we've seen is that in this men's double situation, there may not even exist a stable matching. It seems counterintuitive that there should be a big difference between arranging a mixed doubles and a single sets doubles. In the former case, good, that is stable, matchings exist and can be found efficiently by a simple algorithm, whereas in the single sex doubles case, there may not exist any satisfactory matching at all. Again, before one attempts to apply this conclusion, to bisexual or gay dating, a temptation which some web accounts fail to resist, one should remember that the basic assumptions behind this analysis do not accurately represent human courtship behaviour. Presenting this theory in terms of dating and marriage is a good way of making it interesting, but the real applications, um, at least of the basic algorithms, are in different areas, such as, such as matching trainees to internships. While the Gale-Shapley algorithm 
undoubtedly has some relevance to computer dating. The basic algorithm, as I have presented it, is unlikely to make a fortune for any potential matchmaker because it solves the wrong problem. Dating agencies want to generate a reasonable number of possible matches for all their clients, not to find a single perfect match for everyone. They might like to do that, but it's not realistically possible. So more complex versions of the algorithm will be needed. So let's sum up. Sorry, yes. We've seen a number of mathematical approaches to finding matchings. The secretary problem addresses one aspect of the problem. If we have constraints on who may marry whom, Philip Hall's theorem tells us whether or not it's possible to find a matching which meets these constraints. For the situation where we know everybody's preferences regarding partners, the gale shapley algorithm gives us an efficient way of allocating people which is guaranteed to be, in a precise sense, the best possible matching for one of the sexes, but is equally guaranteed to be the worst possible matching for the other sex. We've seen that whereas viable matchings exist when we're pairing one set with another, the situation is very different when we're pairing off members of a single sex. So for example, the problem of assigning roommates turns out to have no good solutions. So in these situations, no good matching may be possible. Although I've tried to show that the idealization required to turn a problem into mathematics means that the mathematics I've presented today is, in its simplest form at least, of limited value to real-life matchmakers. It does solve other important problems, like matching trainee doctors to hospitals. But even though the mathematics is effective, choices still have to be made. Do we prioritise the wishes of the doctors or of the hospitals? And this shows that decisions about implementing mathematical algorithms require sensitive non-mathematical choices to be made. So after this evening investigating the mathematics of love, and you will notice that although Cupid's darts are random, all the mathematics we've done tonight has been entirely deterministic, um, next, my next lecture, one month from today, will explore how mathematicians use randomness to actually solve non-random problems. I hope to see you then. Um, thank you for listening, and I should be very happy to answer or to try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.